Hi, welcome to The Bad Art Show. I'm Jenna Sparrow, and we have with us again Monterey Martinez for Hello. round two. Woohoo! Um, I hope you're excited. We are back with your dead future Baby daddy, daddy. Yeah. I guess is how I would how put would, that. Yeah, that sounds right. And Jenna has her pretty cup and still didn't bring me a cup. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> she's going to drink out of plastic because yeah. she's bad for the environment. Um, <laughs> yes. yes, I am. Yeah. So um, where did we leave off last? He was at war, I he, think. Uh, the very last thing was he, goddamn, he met the, he met the one chick who was all yeah, so he's married. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's married. Yeah, he met the chick that the woman war. was like, "Hey, she has a kid." He fell madly in love with her. Yes. His career was like doing pretty good, and then he got another ex ex. What is it called? Exhibition. Exhibition. I was like expedition. <laughs> I was like he was <laughs> no, on a you boat. Should stick with yeah, that. <laughs> he was on an expedition. But then the Titanic happened two days before. Oh yeah, yeah. okay. And he was like. But he didn't blame that on that because he's a real man. Because he's he takes responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that's right. His career's chugging along at this point. That's right. He he had put out form, um, and that was World War One was happening right at that time. Oh, the Holocaust. Because you were like, oh, you're like this is what a Holocaust was. Remember, you're like, oh, it's actually to burn. Oh yeah, it's derived from a Greek word. That's right. Okay, yeah. so that's where we were at. So that was World War One. So now we're post World War One at okay. this point. So this is 1920. In 1920, he ends up separating from this wife that he loves so much. But it's a little more complex than that. Okay. Um, because it, I kept reading these things where they were like, she never got him. She never understood his real ideas, and she was materialistic and all these other things. But Here's what I have to say about that is it kind of seems like he was not great to be in a relationship with. Right. Like potentially a little bit unstable. Because he had all those mommy issues, right? And men who he's have mommy issues. He's got mommy issues. issues. Yeah. And he's not materialistic. But remember, she has a kid. So you do have to provide. Totally. She needs some stability to some feel safe. Some stability. Yeah. yeah. And I think that they're, I mean, this is me really going out on a limb, but maybe yeah. they weren't on the same level sexually. Uh, because there was like one of his acquaintances that was like, because a lot of his work is very erotic and yeah. dirty. I don't I want to say a lot, but some of it. And so people think that he's like this sex addict sort of person. But one of his friends once was quoted saying, like, if Austin did ever have sex, it was once a month with his wife. So I actually think it was more like a repressed uh, sexual thing. And so he ends up cheating on her with it. one of his models. And the story goes that that maybe she walked in on him in bed with one of his Damn. Models. Is that but, one of the models right there? So this is a work that he did afterwards. So this is going to be um, the negation of unity is wisdom. So this is in 1919. This is right around the time that they're separating. Got it. And he's working through it. So I think what this one is, is at the bottom, it's actually his wife there. And then the girl up top is actually the woman he cheated on her with. Her name is Frida and she's in a lot of his work. So you might see her, her again and recognize her. How awful. Like when you're like a regular person, it's already bad that we have like social media or whatever that like you have to stay in contact with your exes. But now he's like, hey, I'm going to make famous art like from with you and the woman that I just fucked and cheated on you with and I'm leaving you for, this is going to be around forever in museums <laughs> with your face and your tits on there and her face too. Like, Jesus well, Christ. Well, and I, there is another layer to this and this yeah. that somewhere I read that she actually left him for another man. Oh. So maybe she was actively cheating on him. This might have been a revenge cheat. Got it. Um, it's hard to say. Either way, they kind of make her out to be like the monster in this because they keep saying that she didn't understand him and she was materialistic. But I kind of feel bad for her because maybe she was sold a, a bill of goods that yeah. wasn't what she got, that she thought she was marrying this successful, stable Artist, guy. Yeah. And really, he's a bit neurotic and, and you know. you know, a little, uh, uh, a little creepy with maybe some of the magic that she was like, all right, there's spirits in the house. Like, it was I just don't think to be she's into magic at all. I think yeah. this is just a normal British lady. So right. I think I'm not going to deny that that's part of it. That probably also is part of it that she's like, he's doing witchcraft. Yeah. She's <laughs> like, I'm just trying to have some tea. <laughs> trying to raise he's a got kid. demons in the house now. <laughs> like, what the damn hell? Yeah. Yeah. So th that's the story of how he and Ellie split up. Um, but at this point, Sparrow begins uh, 
saying openly that he is pansexual but celibate. Got so it. that's one of those interesting ones. You too. can fuck anybody, right? Pansexual means pansexual you're attracted means to anyone. you're attracted to anyone, or you're attracted maybe to personalities. Yeah, like be pansexual, mentally stimulated. Yes, because isn't that demisexual too? Like, or demisexual is just like you have to be intellectually stimulated. In I order think that's to what have. demisexual is, and then. It, it, celibate would be asexual which that's right. a movement too yeah so now he's identifying as two of these different things that seem very on opposite yeah it seems contradicting each other yeah but i mean i guess that I, I it comes down to philosophy in the end you'll start to see that all of his ideas and everything that he starts saying like this and again i said he starts identifying as this but that's not really the right way to put it he starts saying these things he doesn't really identify as anything right. he's very individualistic so okay yeah he's quoted saying the disaster of love is that it gives us occasion to love in one person what we should love in all the disaster and of love is that okay? that's actually a really beautiful quote yeah um and I think that's why he became celibate because I think he couldn't. Maybe Handle. he felt like he failed or yeah, something along that line. For you know? sure, that it was like too intense, or it's like yeah, that pain is like pretty pretty dreadful. So maybe I'll just be celibate and like protect myself, you know, just self preservation a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably it. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah. at this point, he's still making art, yeah. right? Uh, so he does the focus of life which comes out in 1921, and it deals with the idea of Zos and Kia a lot more, which, again, is that religion that he's yeah. working with. So I looked this up on my own because I was like, Zos seems so familiar. And you remember th there, one of the earlier images, it had, like, Zolester or something right. like oh, that? Right, oh, yeah, we were like, Zolester. Yeah, 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 yeah. that <laughs> yeah. name? Okay, so then I was like, that's familiar, that's from somewhere, right? It yeah. is from somewhere. It's what like an it? ancient Iranian, it's the first monothel theistic religion that ever existed oh. it predates all the abrahamic religions got it so it's what christianity muslim and judaism are all based on got it is this original religion and that's the original prophet from that religion got it so he is the jesus the muhammad the what have you from this right. original concept of monotheistic damn religion. okay so that's how far back he's going so he is studying it, at least the idea of uh theology Right, you know? so he's he's in that world. He's, he's in that world. So he's Zos, trying to figure out what life is. Yeah, yeah. and we were saying, uh, I was saying in the last episode that Zos was probably his initials, AOS, um, but instead he put a Z on there, which is still possible, but also it might just be that Messiah's name. Right. And then I remembered a long time ago, so it'll come up again, but um, Austin Spare's really into Nietzsche. Oh, okay. And is I that how you pronounce it? I never knew. Yeah. Oh. oh um, I tried speech. to read, yeah. thus spoke Zala Thursta Thrastra. Okay. A yeah. long time ago. And yeah. I remember, I mean, you can see how far I got. I don't know. I'm, That's pretty far. Yeah. I, it's not. And, <laughs> and I'm like decent at reading like and coloring even, crayons yeah. in there. I'm like, I mean, I thought I was like, okay, I've read Tolstoy and I enjoyed that and I, I got a lot from that. So I was like, oh, I'll read Nietzsche and I'll see how that goes. And what, like, what it is it just like just super complex or is it just so intense or is it it's, just like, I want to say that it's like all allegory, but I'm just not following and it uh, seems like overkill. Okay, okay. It seems like it's a lot of like, la, 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 but like la, la. God allegory stuff, like the point of life. God or is like, dead. Oh, he's like the granddaddy to all the stuff that Austin Spare is saying. Right. And I said last time that he called uh, Freud. And young, young, yeah. He called him fraud and junk, yeah. But he seems to very much respect Nietzsche, right? So I think that that's more in tune. So if anyone's ever read Nietzsche, then maybe you understand more about awesome. this than yeah. I do. <laughs> and maybe he can marry you and not leave you for a model that he draws. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Um, yeah, so he's getting really, really into this religious stuff at this point. One of the another quotes that I liked from him was, the virtue is to be equally different. Thy complaint is the calamity. The hypocrite is always at prayer. Meaning like uh, the hypocrite is always at prayer because they don't view themselves as being the catalyst right. to what they need in their life. They have yeah. to ask for external things. For sure. You know, and so to be different – to move away from these organized religions is much better, is what he's saying. Yeah. And uh, when people complain about stuff, they make it, you know, they're complaining to their God about this or that. Right. It's kind of just, that's the downfall of society, the yeah. way he sees it. I mean, that's the way I took it, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. So he gets really, really into philosophy. 
And and I think a lot of this is coming from his depression, from yeah. his marriage falling apart. Right. Because whatever either of them did, I don't think he's not at fault. I'll put right. It for sure. And how old is he at this point? Is he like in his 20s or like 30s? Oh, God, I'm going to have to do math. Because well, like, you said he was born in 1886, right? Yeah. So 1920s. So he's like, yeah, in his mid 30s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Because when he met her, I think he was 25. Oh, okay. So yeah, he's probably 30s at this point. Yeah. So... Yeah, so he puts out that focus of life in 1921, and it's mostly full of female nudes. So he has a bunch of nude models. So I guess he gets to look at naked women all the time, mm-hmm. which is great when you're going through a divorce. Yeah, you know? uh, he in. really starts to hone in on chaos, chaos magic. Okay, and starts to talk more. We talked about automatic drawing right earlier, and so it's the idea of making the subconscious come out through your conscious right so he's really really into the subconscious at this point uh and he's talking to another friend of his i think it was one of his collectors and one of the quotes that he said to him was i suppose my own subconscious desire is to be poor because that's that's (laughs) what keeps coming through to suffer i mean that's really i think yeah poor is an umbrella under suffering and i think a lot of people's subconscious is to naturally it's like you're either going to suffer or you're going to have love and i feel like that's the constant battle where you know when we're born there is this like addiction to suffering because everybody goes through something even if you do have a good life your mom neglected you at some point or your dad like wasn't around or there's some sort of thing that you got used to that now you're like hardwired to be like oh, this feels at peace for me because I'm so used to the pain, so I feel comfortable in it. So I feel like, yeah. That's I, your normal. Yeah, yeah that's it becomes your normal. your normal. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think the other thing is like when people really take to heart the idea that they're an artist, whether that be in whatever form, it, suffering is a big part of that, of like totally. I'm suffering for my art to yeah. create whatever my art is. And whether you like it or not, that's deep in your subconscious because yeah. you're driven to create this art yeah. at whatever cost it's going to come at, you know? Right. So I think that's definitely, I think he is dead on the money with that. Yeah, was absolutely. His subconscious to desire was to be poor. Yeah, just be poor. yeah for just sure. Settle. Uh, this next work that we have on there is a piece from the Golden Hind. Mm-hmm. And it is, is a quarterly modernist art publication that he began to put out and it was nicknamed the golden heim that wasn't oh. it, its original What's name heim? Hind, Hind. oh Hind. yeah um it wasn't its original name but they ended up getting that name because the first edition of it was full of his female nudes which all oh, had like big, big fleshy asses, asses. <laughs> that's hilarious so in the book was gold so they ended up calling it the golden Hind. that's so funny yeah and it like he, Kim Kardashian, we had this before you. Yeah, okay. way before you, girl. Yeah, <laughs> it it was pretty popular, but um, it wasn't quite enough. So he ended up moving to a much poorer neighborhood in London around this time because he wasn't okay. making as much money. Yeah, he had gone through the divorce. I'm sure he lost a lot to that. And this ended up stopping after only a few publications. I think it was eight. Uh, but it did have this piece in it that's one of his more well-known pieces called The New Eden. And that's and this one? That's this one here. So when we were talking about last episode where I showed those other artists that I think inspired him a little bit, this one is very William Blake-like. Right. It it has a lot of those same qualities to it. So um, it's got weird open space, but there's like that strange creature that has bat wings coming yeah. out of its head. And is that a snake at the bottom or it's what a is that? a snake at Ooh. the bottom, yeah. yeah. It, she's like looking down on a snake with yeah. a crescent moon. Yeah. yeah it's very much uh, gives gives big William Blake vibes. Totally. <laughs> um, and one of the other guys that was doing the publication with him said that he the reason why he thinks it failed is because the quarterly art literature model of putting out these publications was for a time that's long past of silk hats and drawing rooms and permanent marriages Uh, meaning like the world's becoming more modern and it's moving past this i I guess bourgeois idea like this type of like are you saying like that where the publications would go to like yes. actually be like enjoyed yes. those places people where upper no middle class existence. would collect these art publications and okay. now we're moving away from that we're getting into a more modern era where no one has time to sit around in their living room and right. flip through a book while they yeah, drink people tea. are like working more like yes. whatever the fuck they're women doing. are voting okay yeah. <laughs> women are voting and we're at a time when women are about to be voting we don't have time to sit yeah, in the drawing room we don't do that anymore. yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's kind of, he. they're coming into a new era in art is really what that is. Got it. So then 1924 comes around and he publishes the Book of Ugly Ecstasy, which is a book of automatic drawings that oh, we looked at cool. earlier. So it's a lot of those like, they morph into animals and then back yeah. into humans. Um, Ugly ecstasy. I like that. That's it's the, pretty good, yeah. right? It's a good name. Yeah. And this book wasn't published, wasn't actually like fully published until 1972. So that's oh, how poor damn. he was. He couldn't afford to publish his book. Wow. So that happens. Then in 1927, the Anthema of Zos, I hope I pronounced that right, um, the, the Sermon to the Hypocrites and Automatic Writing is another book that he puts out. And this is just his automatic writing. Damn. So you said you had practiced yeah. that or you knew people who did? Oh, yeah. No, I just like have heard about it on YouTube and then I start doing it. And I was like, oh, I love doing this because and I love that it's called the Sermon to the Hypocrites. I'm like, that resonates with my soul because you know you're always writing something i'm like who is this to and it's like the sermon to the hypocrites that's who it's to okay mine would be like gatekeepers <laughs> or hacks yeah. but it's like so yeah i i but those are, those are hypocrites think yeah. about those two things that you just said the gatekeepers and and the hacks those people within the comedy world exactly are the hypocrites of the comedy totally world. and like you even know? just like not out of like the microcosm of comedy it's like just in life in general like there's yeah. so many like gate people who like there's people who like gatekeep pain, like, or there's people who like gatekeep, you know, uh, That's just a weird one, right? But they, people <laughs> yeah. do. They're like, well, well, I went through this and did it. And you're like, so none of all, any of us haven't suffered or any of it. Like, yeah. you think pain discriminates? They're like, oh, well, you have this, so you must not know this. You're like, that's not how pain comes to everybody. So. I know. People like to rank their pain. That's the funniest thing to me. It's so Like, you've obnoxious. been through stuff that's tough, but I've been through more. Yeah. You're like, but how do you? You don't even know. You're just like yeah, looking you don't at know a person. Bitch. Yeah. <laughs> My daddy's house had wheels on it. Okay. Like, but people will just, they'll just assume. And you're like. Absolutely. It's so obnoxious. So. I love that. Yeah, and you should take that. The Sermon to the Hypocrites. I mean, yeah. no one's going to know what it's in a reference to. That yeah. book actually wasn't published until 1990. So you can Damn, buy that now. I was four. But, yeah, but he didn't have the money to I'm publish I'm kidding. I wasn't things. born yet. Uh, <laughs> I'm really insecure about my age. So all yeah. of this stuff, as I was yeah. saying, is it all goes back to the Nietzsche sort of thing. So he's right. reading Nietzsche and then he's doing automatic writing. So some of cool. the ideology is coming out through him. Hell um, yeah. And this goes back to the idea of Zos. He's constantly talking about Zos and not doing well financially. So I don't know how those two things are aligned <laughs> with each other, but somehow they he are. He is constantly, you know, connecting with some spirit named Zos and he's really broke. And I'm like, Zos seems like he might be a bad influence. I don't know. Or maybe you're focusing so much on Zos that you're forgetting that you do live in a materialistic yeah, world. Yeah, like you still got to do the dishes, bro. Yeah, like which I, I've known people who are geniuses who are like this, where they're so smart, they're amazing. You probably know someone I'm talking about right mm -hmm. now. But, um, and then, they just like the actual day to day for sure is overwhelming. It's hard to like them. ground them. Yeah. Because, and I understand that too. And like, there's times like my boyfriend, like I'll be, you know, I'll get out of a meditation and I'm like, I just learned this thing about universal consciousness. And he's like, all right, but like, we got to go to the bank. Like you got to go pay your phone bill. <laughs> Like, that's great. You, you talk to spirits today. Like, we got to let's yeah. let's get in the shower. OK, we're going to do the shower. And I'm like, you don't understand me. He's like, no, no, no. You don't understand. You live in this world. Yeah. OK, yeah. Like you got to yeah, be here. And it's and you need people to ground you like that, because the more and more that you're it, it's so exciting and you want to be like, holy fuck, like I learned all these things and like I want to just like stay up there. And it's like you came from there just like you're here now. So, yeah, you're here. How are you going to make that work while you're here? For it's sure. temporary. So, yeah. So Mental you'll go worry. Yeah, 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 yeah. You will. You're going to die. Don't you worry. You're going to die. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think he's living a little bit too much in that realm. But that's OK, because yeah. his art is not suffering. And we'll get yeah. into that. Um, he let's think he begins turning at this point almost entirely against the institution. So anything that you would view as like the arts or the art. Right. World, yeah. He is now opposed to them. And it's not even that he had a falling out with them. It's that he's becoming to get enlightened and he's finally able to see the bullshit. Right. That it really is. Totally. And it really is. Right. Any industry. And I use that word in any way. Yeah. is Bullshit. If yeah. you're bowing down to that industry, you're doing it wrong. For sure. Just the bureaucracy. <laughs> 
bureaucracy. Bu- yeah, right? bureaucracy. Bureaucracy in any fucking field is just like a thing where you're like, whether it's like politics or whether it's art or whether it, fucking restaurants, you know what yeah. I mean? There's always <laughs> something where it's like the management yeah. of whatever you're doing and you're like, hey, we're just trying to do food or like, hey, we're just trying to do art. And then like the management comes in and they're like, well, actually, because they just care about numbers. They just our care brand. about- Our brand. Yes, our <laughs> brand. Um, okay, so HR says you guys can't say, hey, folks, you have to say, hi, ma'am. So what it's like, yeah. they come in with all this bullshit and you're like, hey, you're you're coming in in the middle and I understand your role, but your role should just be like, yeah, just make sure we all clock in or like, yeah, make yeah. sure like nobody's fondling each other or whatever. Your role should be facilitating. Yes. If you're in a bureaucratic situation, your role should be facilitating. I was thinking about this about restaurants the other day because obviously we've, vo- yeah. we've worked in restaurants for many years, but I was thinking about how we were saying last time that like, if I'm not having fun with you, I don't want to spend any of my time with you. And I remember I used to be working at restaurants and managers would come up and they'd be like, hey, how's it going? The question really is like, how are your tables going? Yeah. But I would always take an opportunity to be like straight up not having a good time. (laughs) Like I would rate this one out of 10. The ice machine isn't working. Okay. (laughs) You want to go handle that before you ask me how I'm doing? Okay. One of the cooks is on cocaine and he (laughs) thinks he's putting garnishes on dishes and it's garbage. All right. Yeah. I mean, I would always try to turn it into a joke, but I would yeah. just be like straight up not having fun. <laughs> like, this is not fun. Yeah. Can we turn straight on a TV? Like, yeah. <laughs> I hate this. Totally. That's so and funny. even they'd be like, how are your tables? And I'm like, oh, my tables are fine. I'm telling you, I'm not enjoying yes, this. Yes. You <laughs> could make this a little bit different, a little bit better. Yeah. Can I not do this? I yeah. don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> no, no, ma'am. Yeah. So. He starts pushing against all the rigid formality of the art world the same way he did against Crowley and against all those other magical people who had really intense, uh, rigid ways of systems of doing things. Right. Um, And at this point, his father dies, Mm. who was one of his biggest supporters. Damn. Which is very sad. Which is very sad. Very soon. Yeah. So he just got out of that divorce a few years ago. I guess it's almost 10 years ago now. And then his father dies. And he's poor and his mom's a cunt. He's poor. Then his main collector, who is actually kind of a famous guy, Pickford Waller, dies as well right after his dad. So those are two people who are supporting him financially. um, And they're both gone quickly after another. Um, uh, A socialite, there's a quote from her that she went and visited him at his home to pick up some images. And... She noted that he lived in squalor and she believed his work would be sold posthumously at a greatly inf- inflated price. Yeah. She said this to him and he thought it was hilarious. Yeah. And also was like, you're right. Yeah. Like this will be worth a lot of money one day. And right now I'm living in this derelict, you know, wow. apartment in this bad part yeah. of London. So he had a sense of humor about the whole thing, For I guess. Sure. I'm like, oh no. I was like, God. Is, uh, I, I mean, like, imagine someone telling you that, like being yeah. like, Monterey, you're so funny. And once you're dead, people once are going to love dead, it. Once you're dead, people are going to get it. They're going <laughs> to totally get it. Right? Gonna you're going to be it. poor the whole entire time. You're going to be suffering. But when you die, people, people are going to laugh. They're going like, to love you. They're going to love you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Finally, you'll get what you yeah. deserve. Yeah. So then at this time, they write an article about him called A Genius and a Tenement, talking about how he's living in a tenement building with a bunch of other people um, and studying spiritualism and that he isn't interested in everyday life. God, this is sounding more and more like me. I'm like, oh, God, this I, is my life. So okay. what was it last time she thought this was her boyfriend from the past? And I was like, maybe it's you, yeah. bitch. Like, Except for mine would be a girl in other people's apartments and she wears all their clothes clothes doing comedy or something <laughs> girl something. girl bouncing from one other comics apartment to another <laughs> in disguise by <laughs> watching their animals yes <laughs> it's a real job okay yeah, it's a job you, do i like most of the animals no <laughs> do i have a roof over my head yes it's your roof and i use your clothes these Perfect. are not my earrings <laughs> they're not <laughs> just we just want to be transparent here. Yeah, let me be transparent. These are Sarah Lawrence's earrings. And I, these are actually my clothes, but I have been wearing a lot of her clothes. In general, when I was at your house, I, I wore... Is she going to watch this? Because- <laughs> she knows. You really wear a lot of my stuff. Yeah, right? At yeah. least she gives it back. That's what's important. That's important. Okay. That's the really and important part. And I will part. wash it. I will wash See? it. See? There you go. That's Thank all you. that needs to be done, you know? That's it. Uh, so at this point, he's selling his work to one to five guineas. Is how, like, so each one of these is... I don't know what that translates What's a guinea? to. Yeah, because like this is before pounds or is guinea just less than a pound or like what the hell is that? I suppose it's before pounds because I just know guineas is like Italian pound. people. Like when people are like, oh, that fucking guinea. 
I would say I'm going to cut that, but I'm not. Uh, <laughs> definitely not. Yeah. Um, no, I believe that a guinea is a is a form of payment. Okay. I don't think he's trading, trading one to five little, Italian little <laughs> Italian children. He's like, this one will, you know, mop and sweep. This one makes really good calzones. He has Italian slaves in exchange yeah. for paintings. Anyway. It's a nice way. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, he's quoted at this time saying, "Why in a world of drunken, uh, why in a world with drunken wealth and populated by host of people who would be glad to acquire the work, has he had difficult finding a living?" Mm. Um, and I think that that's a good point. There's a lot of people who are very into spiritualism at the time, yeah. or just would think these are really well done pieces of art, which they are. So, yeah, um, yeah. I'm going to read this other thing on here that is actually a quote from Austin Spare because I thought you would like it. Uh-huh. But unknown to themselves, I believe many artists are inspired by outside forces or that they work through their subconscious mind. All significant art, I believe, comes from that source. It is inspiration, revelation, spiritual truth, which men express in different ways that they have developed. And Hell I yeah. thought that was really good. Yeah. You know, all significant art comes from that place. For sure. So you may not like it. You may not like someone else's art. Yeah. But if it's significant, then it's coming from that deep place. That totally. subconscious place. Yeah. Which is why things are funny even when they're sometimes offensive. Right. Is because your subconscious is actually what's laughing at it. Yeah. Like when you laugh almost against your will. Yep. You know, like I think that's when a David tells quotes is that he always wants to make people like laugh when they don't want to laugh yeah and that's true because that's your subconscious laugh absolutely like you can't like it's it's just involuntary where like it just happens and uh rick rubin talks about kind of like a very close in theme to like that quote of where it's like there's this like ether of like the before space of like before anything like physicalizes into the material world where like when people meditate or when people are just, you know, I'm sure it happens to you like when you're painting, when it's like your your physical body is completely distracted, then you get to like get in this zone where you're in alignment, like in that ether space where like all of a sudden like it's like inspiration. It's like it's like a magnet and it just like comes down because so often like have you ever thought of an idea and then you didn't act on it and then someone has an idea just like that and you're like well what the fuck and it's like it's because it's in the ether and I, you pulled it down i wrote an entire joke yeah and then i never i never tried it because i was like oh, i need to work on it more yeah and then two months later i saw another comic yeah. it's much farther along than me post and i mean it it was almost word for word Damn. i never told it to anyone yeah i never like it was very weird. For it was sure. a weird feeling where I was like, this person from a totally different background, yeah. a totally different everything, has the exact same joke that I have. Damn, that's happened to me with like show ideas. Like, I mean, and I have them written down. Like, I have them like as evidence. Not like I, no one stole my idea. Yeah, yeah. For SNL with one sketch, and I turned in a spec script anyway. Um, <laughs> but uh, <Damn>. it was <laughs> a thing of uh, like, but, but that does happen. It sure does. And you sign a thing that says like, hey, anything that I write in here, like they're like, I'm not allowed to use it ever again. And they're like, it doesn't say like, we'll use it. But it says like it, this thing that you're turning into us is no longer your property. Oh, I would never. Yeah. And so it's like, whatever. But it's a thing. But anyway, like with other ideas where I'm like, okay, like I've written a treatment or outline for something. And then I just am like, ah, I don't have time to finish. Like I'm just trying to do other things. And then I'll see a TV show and I'm like, holy fuck, like I had that exact idea. And I think it's because it's like, yeah, we're all we're all sourcing it from the before or whatever, where it's just like thoughts and well, vibrations. I think, yeah, I think we're sourcing it from before and we're also sourcing it from the present reality that we live in. So if right. you're dealing with the situation in your life, like what I just described of watching yeah. people get their start, cars stolen all around me. Yeah. Other people are also living in that reality. For sure. So it's no stretch to think that two humans who both have like interesting ways of looking at the world. Might totally. not even be the same way, but could yeah. come up with a similar thing. I think it's like parallel thinking. Parallel thinking. Yeah. yeah. It's absolutely a thing. So when people go like, oh, so-and-so stole so-and-so's joke, it's like- It's like, unless the punchline is exactly the same. And it does happen. It's very rare, but that's like yeah, where it's but like it's more also, common. it's also, we all live on earth. Totally. <laughs> but like, that's why I try not to do topical jokes a lot yeah, of times yeah. because I'm like, I know Too so easy. many comics are going to approach this. And so if I do something that's just personal or like my own emotional space, like most people are not psychotic, like me. No, I'm kidding. But um, <laughs> they don't have these problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you think that the voices make you do bad things. My voices are trying to help me and I'm the bad one. Okay. 
Um, but no, that that is true though, because I, that often happens with like sketch shows. Because yeah. yeah, you're pulling from the world that we all live in, so you guys are going to come up with similar ideas. Totally, like that's going to happen. Yeah, which I get, but and that happens with artists all the time too. I actually remember being in college and I had drawn out. I had spent all this time drawing out. I was doing like a woodcut or something and spent all this time drawing it out in class where mm -hmm. other people were watching me draw it. Right. And the day that I was like ready to start carving on it, cause I had already worked out all of my image correctly. Another girl came in mm -hmm. and had completely taken like all of it. the composition was different, but all of the imagery was the same. It's often like composite imagery that I would use right. when I was doing woodcuts. And it was to the point that, like, the professor pulled me aside and was like, I can tell her that she's not allowed to do that. Damn. Because that is so blatantly that she watched you create this for a week. Yes. And then came in and, d and did, like, a shitty copy of it. Totally. So he's like, I can intervene in this situation right. as the professor and be like, that is unacceptable. And he was like, what, what route do you want to do? And I said, I'm scrapping it. Wow. I said, if it's another idea that someone else can do, yeah. if she's even capable of doing a shitty version of it, yeah. then it wasn't that good of an idea. Right. So I'm just going to lose That's it. That's how I'm with know? jokes. Like if someone has something, I'm like, I'm just going to drop it because I'm like, ooh, like then I need to set my game up and think of something, you know? But yeah. it's like, but that that girl reminds me of the perfect example of what he's talking about, the fucking, the sermon to the hypocrites of where it's like, hey, they don't know how to source inspiration. So how they think of sourcing inspiration is they go around, they look at their peers, they assess themselves, they compete, and then they they concoct this thing of just, you know, pulling from other people yeah. instead of being like, no, you can connect, you can go to source and you can pull down inspiration, but you're not in a space where you're either not at peace or you're, you know, you're so in survivor mode, which I get or whatever, but it's like, you have to learn to get into that space where you can pull down your own inspiration. But most of these, I mean, that's why you see so many stand-up comics where it's like, they're all doing like, you know, Bumble jokes or then they all do Donald Trump jokes. Or that it's because I'm like, you don't know how to source inspiration because you're not an actual artist. You're they a person don't know that just how to reach act. the subconscious, to totally. reach into that subconscious. And so I think that's why his work, as we'll go into this, is such a predecessor for all of the other movements coming after him. Right. Because he was reaching into the subconscious before the other people. Absolutely. So he's getting the ideas first. He's putting them onto paper onto canvas, onto whatever materials he's working on. And then 10 to 50 years later, other artists are coming through and having similar ideas. Yep. And then everyone's like, wait, wasn't Austin Spare doing that? Yep. That's what you're going to keep seeing. So what that is, is that's reaching in to the subconscious, or you could say the collective, whatever has you. But he's the first one doing it, so he's doing it first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're like the explorers that like go out there first on these boats and they're getting all thrashed around or half of them yeah. die. And then everybody's like, oh, then they come on the Titanic. And that's why it sank, because you should have been on that Mayflower, okay? If you really were about that life. But yeah. We don't condone it because <laughs> we're <on> colonialism. <laughs> yeah, and it's just at the point where it's like you just have to be a person of like, hey, how can we in our life now try and make things better? And that's what we could be responsible for. I say for. that all the time when people blame other groups of people for things, it, whatever those may be, where I'm like, you know, we're all born with the same history. Right. There's this history that comes before us and we're born into the world where that exists and we can't change it. For sure. And some historians think they can change it. They try to highlight certain facts over others. But the reality is we're all born into this shitty history yeah and it is shitty it's very violent and shitty yeah and humans are trash <laughs> trash, they're trash trash yes totally. and we're all born into it so how do we make it better here moving forward each and every day for, for sure all of us? that's really what it comes down to totally and like i get like it's a thing that you have to acknowledge because a lot of the times because i know like in my own personal life or if i'm like telling someone like hey i'm emotionally disrupted because of this thing that you did and you don't realize how much it's affecting me so it's like i totally believe in like acknowledging something yes but also because i had a really hard like i grew up on section a and I grew up on food stamps and all that stuff. And it's like, I can be a victim or I can feel bad for myself and I can be like, hey, it's because of this, it's because of this. And it is because of these things. But at the same time, that mental space of me having blame and me having anger, I'm never going to shift into the next gear where I have the ability to have self-love and have self-worth and get myself in a better position because I've been angry and I've been upset mm -hmm. and I've been jealous for so many years. 
and it got me nothing. It got never will. Some jokes, but mostly nothing. <laughs> yeah. Some great jokes. Some jokes <laughs> that I got to live in other people's houses, but it got me nothing. But so. she's homeless. <laughs> <laughs> But I just got my own apartment. I'm moving February 1st. Big girl. Yeah. (laughs) So at this point, our boy, uh, Austin Spare, comes out with Experiences in Relativity, which is an exhibition that relies heavily on the idea of anamorphism. Anamorphisms. 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 That sounds good to me. I think it's anamorphisms. I think you nailed it. Uh, Which anamorphisms... I really can't do that word. I think you're saying it perfectly right. (laughs) Is the idea of having to view art through a specific angle Mm. or sometimes it's through like a specific tool. But if you think of like, have you ever seen like street art that's kind of optical illusion type of art? Okay, that became very big in the mid-century. Got it. um, A a little bit before mid-century. But Austin Spare is doing this way before. Wow. So he's doing these pieces. A lot of them are drawings of women and they're from strange angles where it's like, oh, is that drawn incorrectly? No, it's drawn at this weird angle that's not realistic. Wow. Um, So it's all these augmented views. And this is his last major show in the what's called the West End of London, which is where all the art galleries are. But they're beautiful. And um, I'll I'll call back to them later because um, they're very interesting. So this is the 30s then that this is happening. So and then in 1936, or I guess it's the end of the 20s, beginning of the 30s. 1936, surrealism comes to London. What so, is surrealism again? Like surrealism for- is a movement um, that focuses a lot on unconsciousness and dreams, and it relies on realism, the form of realism where you're drawing real things that people can actually identify, mm-hmm. but you're doing them in ways that are either physically impossible or they're just like uncanny. So it's in like a weird an interpretation way. of yes. reality. Salvador Dali, as we mentioned Got the it. other day, one of the top uh, surrealist artists that you would that you would know of. And it's steeped in a lot of uh, Freudian ideas. Got it. Okay. So they're coming from that perspective. And it kind of, that kind of blossomed in Paris, but then they came to London after that. And Austin Spare did not care for the surrealist. He did oh, not like them. <laughs> okay. So the artists who were big, I mean, there's a hundred artists that are big during this movement. Yeah. The main ones whose names you might know would be like Salvador Dali or uh, Rene Magritte or uh, Max Ernst. Those are like some of the big names. But um, I wonder why he didn't like, w- w- does it, does it, do we know why he doesn't like artists who do surrealism? Um, it's not particularly clear why he doesn't like them, but mm. maybe because they're relying on Freudian mm. beliefs and he's not as into that. Got it. And I mean, I also think that the surrealist as a movement is – so surrealism comes after Dada, which okay. Dada is a movement where it's like absurdity, where okay. they start to question even the idea of art. Like if you've ever seen an image of the urinal on the table as uh, just an art piece. Okay, okay. So it's like questioning what art even is, is Dada, and that's when performance art started becoming a thing, like the type that you would see in an art gallery museum. Yeah. So surrealism comes out of that movement and kind of brings that – ridiculous movement back into like, okay, we can bring this back into painting and art museums and stuff that people actually want to buy. For sure. And I'm going to speak for myself on this because surrealism is one of my least favorite movements. Okay. And I think that it's because there's something commercial about it got it it's like they're it's like shock comedy okay to me surrealism is like shock comedy they're doing stuff to get people's attention isn't it weird and Uh, funny what i'm doing and how weird i got it so i feel like maybe again i obviously don't know this artist but i'm saying like maybe like his thought on it is that there's not a real like genesis of creativity it's them being like, what would look weird? Or like, what would be crazy? Like ver- like if you're writing a joke, you're like, what do I think people laugh at? Okay, what do girls like? What do girls yes. like? Um, okay, let me do um, let me do hair. Like, let me do makeup. Versus being like, this is what I think is funny. This is what I want to do. Yeah. And whatever that is, like, I'm 
so, strong enough to put it on canvas. So what you just described is a hack comedian. Yeah. And I have a feeling that Austin Spare felt that way about the Surrealist. Got it. Okay. And I don't think that all the Surrealists are hacks. That's not what I'm saying. For sure. I'm just saying it's not my favorite movement because there seems to be something. He made fun of Crowley earlier by saying that he seemed like he was mongering for advertisement. Yeah. And that I strongly feel that with the Surrealist movement. I mean, totally. I couldn't feel anything more strongly. It's like yeah. they want people to be like, look at me, look at me. Yeah. And maybe because I don't enjoy being the center of attention, that right. that's not, I don't know. That's It's not for me. For sure. So at this point, when the Surrealists move there, Austin Spare begins rep- referring to his own anamorphism? Anamorphism. I don't know. Sounds right to me. (laughs) He starts calling it side realism. Mm. So, and I think that's kind of a such good little witty like like word plays or whatever. I think it has something to do with like pertaining to the stars, but it's kind of a jab at surrealism. Got it. And so at this point, when surrealists come to London, some of the art critics there start to notice like, Austin Spare was doing this sort of stuff before it became popular. Right. And so they started calling him Britain's forerunner in the surrealist movement and Mm. the surrealist in surrealism. And so that actually got him a little bit more attention all of a sudden. So now he was able to start showing his own work kind of in conjunction at galleries again while this this was kind of like a hot thing. So Got it. even though he didn't really care for them, he still took the opportunity. Totally. I, I'll put it that way. <laughs> so um, it, there's different quotes about him at this time. A lot of people are saying like he's a genius who prefers painting to money, mm-hmm. which I think that perfectly describes him. Yeah. But they do also say that his work isn't selling because people don't find it pleasant to live with. Mm. And this is something I find <laughs> interesting because people do want to decorate their homes, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, like this quote is, people don't want to be confronted with abnormal imagery that's hard to look at on the daily. Ooh, see, it's like, here's the thing, because I, I take that, I'm like, oh, fuck, that's my comedy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or do you feel attacked? <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, oh, shit. But, but I get that. I respect that. I get that there are people who they just want to come in. They're like, dude, I just want some flowers. I just want some flowers and a fucking vase and whatever. But I think people who really do fuck with art, it's like, no, I I, I want something to provoke me. I want to feel like there's something that hits me that makes me think or that makes me feel like I'm going to like transports me into a different memory or whatever. I think people who really appreciate art, that's why they get art. They're not just like, Hey, I just want whatever, whoever, just put it on here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, and I think there's a couple of different things going on there. The first is, you're right, someone who yeah. really appreciates art yeah. uh, does want something that's a little more challenging and makes them think and makes them feel. Right. However, the people who collect art are the people who can afford to collect totally. art. Totally, exactly. And another thing is there's a lot of suffering in everyday life. Yep. And there are some people, the same reason why some people don't like scary movies, yep. where they're like, well, I already deal with so much suffering every day I don't want to go and suffer in my private time too totally so I think that there's two sides to that but I do think you're right I think that this is a problem we have in contemporary art as well where the people who have the money to actually collect contemporary art yeah they're not the same people as the people who should be the taste makers right you know, yes, the people who should be people the taste who curate makers. it should be the people who really have a who respect it. for it. Yes. You know what I mean? Versus it's like, and that's not how and it happens. art collectors don't view art that way. They view it totally. as an investment. I exactly. mean, they're, they're almost finance bros, if you think yeah, about it. They're so, laundering money through it. Yeah, yeah, a lot of the time. So it's, it's not always the same. So right. at this point, he starts doing portraits of commoners around London, just okay. everyday working class people off the street. Um, and people find found these very hard to live with because, okay. you know, this is 1934 to 1955. Damn. This is like a rough time for London. Yeah. These are really hardworking people. Um, and mm. it, the, part of it is going into the war. Yeah. So at this point, he moves above a homeless shelter and he would pull models Oof. from the homeless shelter and, yeah. and pay them to come model for him. Wow. And he would put out advertisements that said things like uh, looking for models who are not beautiful and over the age of 40 because he was interested not in beauty, but in character. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of get that. As some, I did portraiture for a long time. I got really, really into portraiture. And it, one of the main things that's so fascinating is is people's it, everyone is very unique yeah. in their face. Yeah. There are very few people who are symmetrical. I mean, yeah. God knows I'm not symmetrical, I'm but not that's either. like yeah. what makes it interesting 
totally. to paint and draw people is the different abnormalities in right. the face. I know right. that sounds strange. No, but it's true. Because it's like when something's perfect, it's almost like you I can like respect it, but it almost seems like plain. Yes. It just seems very like plain and it, it, it just there's just no source of like where I'm like, ooh, like yeah. it's just nothing there. Yeah, which is sometimes I think why in contemporary modeling, yeah. sometimes people will see models and they'll be like, oh, she's not hot or he's not yeah. hot. And it's like, yeah, that's not what you're looking yeah, for. What you're looking for is interesting. Right. Yeah. So it, it's a totally different thing. And anyone who's an artist can recognize that. But totally. sometimes people who aren't can't. They're like, who's this painting of this ugly person? Right. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, because most people don't actually have good taste and most people just wait for something to become popular and they go oh yeah i oh, like that too yeah you're like okay yeah absolutely okay. there's a, there's a lot of that in yeah. this story oh, so yeah. um austin spare is an ardent anti-nazi he okay. hates everything about the nazi movement which is coming up in germany yeah at it's this so point. much structure and routine and he hates that so uh, he's it's like, everything shoot. he i mean it really is everything yeah, he hates, hates. it's yeah. like fascism the idea of well technically they're socialists but I don't want to get into that yeah. here, but <laughs> it's like fascist socialism. We'll call what's his face. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the guy that we, you were arguing, like not like oh, arguing, oh, arguing. oh Jackson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I can tell Jackson yeah. that China isn't communist. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he hates the Nazis. You're right. It's everything that he hates. It's like ardent, strict yeah. rules and class systems. That whole thing, telling you what you can and can't do. Um, however, I don't know if you know this. Hitler is an artist. Oh, yeah. I knew so that. So a lot yeah. of people know that. That's pretty common knowledge. Yeah. But apparently a member of the German embassy mm -hmm. buys one of Austin Spare's works and sends it back to Hitler. And Hitler sees this thing and loves it. Oh, so this is one of his portraits that he buys, one of his Londoner portraits. Wow. So he sends it back. Hitler loves it and immediately tells the guy at the embassy, like, we got to get that spare guy over here to do my official portrait. It's like the Korean so, dictator who loved fucking Dennis Rodman or whatever. Exactly <laughs> like that. Okay. So here's the thing. This is before World War II started. So this yeah. is Hitler's rise. At this point, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. just a politician in Germany who's sweeping the nation. Um, and he doesn't even know this, but Austin Spare fucking hates him. <laughs> That's so <laughs> There's no way he would know that. So funny. he invites Austin to go there and do his portrait. And Austin turns him down in the most Austin Spare way I possibly could imagine. Um, this is the note from his letter that he writes. Only from negations can I wholesomely conceive you, for I know of no courage sufficient to stomach your aspirations and ultimates. If you are a Superman, let me be forever an animal. And that is like oh, the snap. sickest burn. <laughs> That's the most like uppity British burn. Wow. It's great. Yeah. However, there's not really any evidence that he actually sent the letter to Hitler. He did write the letter for sure. He wrote Damn. the letter, but I don't know if he actually sent it to him. But at this point, he does this painting of his own face merged with Hitler's face. Oh, that, is, that's a good I, idea. I don't know. Austin. Again, this is before <laughs> World War II starts. Yeah, yeah, so this yeah. is just some guy that he hates, right? So he paints himself like <laughs> Hitler. And there's actually a few variations of this. And in one of the variations of this, it's it's Hitler. Him is Hitler. Austin is Hitler at the bottom. Yeah. And then the letter on the top is written onto the painting, this, this note wow. to Hitler. Um, it's very interesting, though, because you know also that he's like doing the automatic writing and he's yes. doing the automatic drawings and he had the Holocaust thing. And then this whole like, you know, infusing him and Hitler together. It's just like he's he's foreshadowing something that he has no idea. Yeah. And maybe he's also pulling from the like maybe th this idea of of Hitler as a as a character that is coming from some sort of subconscious. So he's pulling that into like him as the subconscious character of what yes. Hitler represents. That's the way that I see this. Is or he's, this is subconscious. That he knows Hitler is an artist, but he doesn't think he's a good artist. And that's why he has to be a politician. So he's merging. He's like, hey, I'm the real artist. And this would like, this is me showing you that I'm the artist. Like you're not the artist. That's why you I'm failed. You and wish you, you could be. You wish that's you could good, be me. Like, that's a good point. I didn't so think I'm of like, it that way. That's yeah. a really good point. That could be what it is. Right. Because I think it was known that Hitler's like an, I don't know if he's an art school dropout, but I know he like didn't do didn't well. Get some, didn't, didn't get into some school that he wanted to or something. I think something. he got into school, but he uh, like didn't do well in it. I'm going to have to do it. an episode on Hitler's yeah. art because it sucks. Um, <laughs> it's not good. I mean, <laughs> that's mean, but it's not. Yeah. It's very amateur level. Um, that's hilarious. Which is, it's great for everyone to try. But, shows you, but it shows <laughs> you once again that it's like when you're not the 
because people there's people who are artists by nature and then there's people who are artists by profession yes and so a lot of people now you're just supposed to appreciate art like if i watch basketball i don't go and be like all right i'm gonna dunk a ball i go hey i'm gonna buy nba tickets you know and a lot of people when they see art or whatever they're like well i can paint because it's more accessible hey i can do comedy yeah exactly (laughs) and then you go no, you're supposed to just like and come to the show. Yeah. But people do it. And those are the people who usually when they fail at it or whatever, because they don't have, again, the ability to like source inspiration naturally, they go crazy. Yeah. They, they go, go crazy and yeah. take over half the world. Or they molest girls or whatever. And yeah. you're like, hey, maybe no. That's a good point. Or they just become an internet troll. At this point, he signs up for the Second World War. Okay. And... He actually gets denied because he's not in good health, but he does end up creating camouflage in the Second World War, which is something... Wait, he created the yeah, design for camouflage? Imi- yeah, these some, yeah, some of the designs for camouflage and for... I wear a camouflage hat all the time. Oh, Come look on. Look at that. Look yeah. at this. So he ends up even designing camouflage for cars, which is interesting Whoa. because they can pick out cars on the battlefield or, you know, if they're moving weaponry. So he does that. Uh, on the That's w- so cool. It's awesome, right? Yeah. So on the worst day of the Blitz, they... They, they turned him down from service because he wasn't in good health and he was getting old. Yeah. But what he did do was he was on what they called fire watch in London, which is when there's bombings in London, volunteer men would go out and their job would be to put out fires if bombs go through roofs and things like that. Oh. So the whole city doesn't burn down. Yeah. So he's out on fire watch on the worst day of the Blitz and a bomb completely destroys his home and apartment and Damn. studio. So he loses 200 to 300 works of art in one <sighs> second and is instantly homeless um but again austin spare is never a victim so he cocks it up he to just sitting <laughs> he calls it just sheer bad luck and yeah. then he also started referring to it as hitler's revenge for turning him down on the commission which is a very funny way of looking for that like that yeah. motherfucker got you back yeah hitler's been after me too okay i'll tell you He's that he has been coming for me so then he ends up sleeping in one of his friend's basements which is not a great situation it's like a damp without any windows room and he's doing his art from down there austin spare is a lifelong animal lover Hmm. so he ends up being an old cat lady basically he has a bunch of stray cats that live in this basement with him which probably is too similar (laughs) it's not very sanitary um at this point people describe him as just like homeless and unkempt and he was he was actually injured during fire watch i don't know what exactly happened to him but i think he was like he hurt his arm or something uh but he was still able to paint but he didn't have any money he didn't have a home it's very sad um but one of his quotes at this time is art isn't about flashes of inspiration it's about sticking at it Hmm. uh and at this point he starts arranging comeback shows so he's still making art even though he's in this basement with no windows yeah and they do an article on him at this point and unfortunately the newspaper article focuses on more of the fact that he's homeless Mm. than on the fact that he's overcoming all of this and he is this great artist right which is always the thing they always want to pull whatever bad thing about you and make that the important thing about your life like seriously instead of letting you be your own hero yeah okay i stabbed two people (laughs) like we're gonna focus on that officer really (laughs) always the bad stuff well at this point he begins because he can't get any regular shows he begins doing shows at pubs and this is when spiritualism starts to come really back in style so he's Mm -hmm. doing portraits of famous spiritualists and people who are in like any sort of occult movement and he also starts doing portraits of famous movie stars oh yeah so the images I have here, it's Joan Crawford and Judy Garland. Oh, how cool. Um, it's Dorothy. Yeah. Yeah. And this is interesting because he is technically the first pop artist. Oh. So yeah. no one was doing this really up until him. So oh, really? So think of the works of people like Andy Warhol. Yeah. Or Patrick Nagel or Alex Katz. Like it, Alex Katz, not so much because it's just close up portraits, but these are all people who came much after him wow. and don't yeah. even realize they're actually picking up the baton from him. Right. He was the first one doing this. So he's doing surrealism before surrealism. Yeah. And he's doing pop art before pop art. Wow. Which is crazy. Totally. And he's doing it better than Warhol. That's right. I'm like, that's right. 
I don't even know, but I'm like, yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> I don't really like Andy Warhol. Yeah. It's I don't not know. For me. I know who he is, but I don't know like enough of his. I haven't seen enough of his stuff for for me to like. It's you know. entry level. <laughs> it's entry level. <laughs> she got the titties out today. I mean, baby. back to that. Back to that. Um, mongering for advertisement. Right. I mean, he might oh. be the number one in the entire art world oh, ever. Yeah. You know, okay. Of people who are mongering for advertisement. Hell I shouldn't yeah. say this. I'm sure he's a nice person. I just, it's his art. I'm <laughs> he's discussing dead, right, right now. Probably. Oh yeah. Okay. Dead. Okay. Yeah. I was like, he's dead. Mm -hmm. yeah. D E A D dead. <laughs> yeah. So at this point he meets Kenneth Grant. Kenneth Grant's wife comes to see him in his studio and buy some works because her husband is a really big fan of his. Mm -hmm. And he already owned the Book of Pleasure, which was one of those first books yeah. that Austin Spare put out. Kenneth Grant is like an occult icon. He was Aleister Crowley's assistant for a long time after Spare and Crowley had a falling out. Got it. Um, and he, if you're in the occult world, you know who Kenneth Grant is. He's the author of a lot of books. And so at this time... Austin Spare writes the Hermetic Grimoires of Zoes, mm. which is another book that he My does. My tattoo is a hermetic symbol. Oh, yeah. there we go. So these are some of his images from that. On, on the left is going to be Kenneth Grant and his wife that uh, Austin Spare actually painted. They're hot, too. <laughs> I think they're yeah. young. They're yeah. a young couple. He becomes very good friends with them, actually. Um, and he ends up having bar shows at this time. They come to all of his bar shows. And they're working with him a lot. They're doing, like, magic together because he's uh, reinvigorated in the occult stuff. So he's right. doing a lot of magic with them. And he's declining commissioned works which is mm. hilarious to yeah me. what so is commissioned work like works me? where people come to him and they say i want you to do this painting oh. and he's like no i only do paintings for me got if it if you want to buy my paintings here I they are it. Yeah. yeah i i am always like that i never yeah. do commissions ever for right. anything um at one of his art shows he had a painting of these three horses and he sold it for almost nothing but it, the show ended up making a decent amount of money and he took all the money from the show remember this man's homeless yeah he gave it to an animal shelter because mm. he was depressed that the horses that he painted because they were like old dying horses yeah. were worth more as glue than they were as someone's animal. Aww. So he's a really nice yeah, I guy. I love him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he's a really nice guy. Still homeless. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you have to that. say that? Yeah. It's probably why I'm the most attracted to him. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if they, at this time art shows at pubs were really popular or taverns, but he made it like a huge thing. Like right. people would go to these. And he would say like, why is having a show at a tavern important? And he said, because it's democratic. Yeah. And it is. Anyone can go there. You know, you don't we have do to be invited. Shows and comedy or in bars all the time. And it's all a thing time. of where it's like a lot of times they don't know that we're here. And we're just like, you got to figure out how to be funny to get them to keep listening. And it's like. They're here to Austin. drink, so yeah. you figure out how to entertain them. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah, so at this point, the pub shows are going pretty well. He can finally actually afford another house, so okay. he's no longer homeless, which is great. He does start referring to himself as Zos the Stoic. Mm -hmm. Zos. Zos. <laughs> which I love. Yep. Um, yeah, and he'll he'll write things on his painting like uh, Zos vel fantios, which is like Zos or death. Oh. So he gets really into Stoicism at this time. And it's going pretty good for him. Again, he's not homeless. He gets introduced through the grants okay. to Gerald Gardner, who is one of the founders of Wicca, okay. the Wicca movement. Yeah. Um, I find this interesting because he seems to not be impressed with Gardner. He's like, whatever about yeah. Gardner. And the reason why I think is because Wicca to me is is right For hand women? oh yeah. well it's right hand magic it's yeah. like you're doing actual you view this as like it's a female god that you're worshiping for sure and you're doing these rigid rituals with robes and right. shit to, so i think he kind of thought this guy's just like a he's an idiot sort yeah of thing. he's trying to get pussy yeah. yeah so that's what wicca is but what's interesting is gardner actually really respected austin spare yeah like he truly believed that Austin Spare could do magic. So he would yeah. come to Austin and have him do sigils for him or things like that to keep him going. So um, at this time, there's a really funny story. And this probably isn't true because Austin Spare likes to lie, but I'm going to yeah. say it anyways. Uh, he tells Grant the story of being the only white man to ever infiltrate the the cult of the coup, the which is a Chinese black magic cult. <laughs> and he said he goes to a South London opium den and <laughs> they put a bunch of poisonous animals and insects and snakes together in this bowl yeah. until only one of them is left. And then they crush up that last poisonous animal and then they make it into a poison for their enemies. 
And that Jesus. could all just be like an opium dream because he was known to do drugs. <laughs> that but I sounds it's like so funny that he's like, I'm the only white guy. <laughs> I'm the only white guy at an opioid opium like what is it pub den yeah, yeah. Opium, den. opium den is an amazing like a chinese opium den amazing sentence say no more and then we're just getting a bunch of poisonous insects and snakes putting them together in a bowl <laughs> letting them kill each other whoever kills each other then we kill it then we take their poison and then we give it to our enemies it does sound very chinese yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you describe it again, I'm like, oh, wait, that actually, that could be true. <laughs> that you <laughs> might have to cut. <laughs> that might have happened now since you're saying it like that. You're like, that's a recipe. I mean, that's I not mean, too it- far away from orange chicken. <laughs> I try it. MSG is in there. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so yeah, at this point, Spare never stops working on his art. He says things like moral courage accrues. Like he just keeps going. Um, the unfortunate thing is now it's the 50s and he's getting a lot older and not really taking care of himself. Yeah. Uh, his longtime patron, Frank Letchford, comes to his house to look for him one day. And the lady next door says he's already been taken to the hospital in an ambulance. Mm. And by the time that he gets to the hospital, Spare had already died. So his appendix had burst. That's how yeah. he ended up dying. So he died in 1956? 1956, yeah. So that made him in the 70s? 70. Yeah, yeah, 69 or 70, probably. Yeah. And he ended That's up being. pretty long. It's a decent amount yeah. of time. Yeah. He ended up being buried next to his father. Um, this is one of mm. his later works that I put up here Elemental Materialism. I thought it was a pretty cool yeah. one. Yeah. All of the names are so perfect and badass. Like, right? Yeah. Yeah. He. It, he is largely unknown, Austin Spare, in the art world, I feel like. It, however, he is having a, a resurgence. Right, yeah. And I think that it more has to do with his occult leanings than anything else. Um, but it is interesting. Like I said, he's the catalyst to all these other movements yeah. that everyone's so familiar with. And this guy started it all. So it's fascinating. A friend on here, uh, I'm going to quote him. He said he was kind, never a victim, and an animal lover. Aww. So that's but yeah, he just seemed great. really cool too. With just a, a lot of his, you know, desire to to tap into other things, and not necessarily like a cult, but just to be like, hey, our society's set up like this, and these are like our rules and our policies, and like let me try to go above and beyond that, and you know, giving himself the freedom to like think and not keep himself so boxed in, and wanting other people to do that, but also having like moral integrity through all is all of his work and i think that's really commendable and also he likes animals and (laughs) he you know he always made women's tits look good he did he did yeah yeah i don't know i i feel like i wanted to do this series because a lot of weird things are said about him and i wanted to bring up the truth of what it really is in my mind is that i don't think that anyone should view him as an occultist or as a deadbeat like loser who never made any money or even as like a queer icon because I don't think it's any of those things because he viewed himself as an individual. Right. That was his main thing. He was yeah. none of the things that anyone prescribed to him. He was an individual. And one of his later quotes that he says, uh, he was like ardently anti-political. Mm-hmm. And he said, never more talk of democracy, actually less. And he never paid taxes. He considered himself an individualist. And he thought that the entire world, not just art, but the entire world needed to return to craftsmanship. Yeah. Like, get a skill, craft your skill, be an individual, stop yeah. aligning with all these things that other people above you are telling you to align with. Totally. And out of it, he made the most incredible art. Yep. That, exactly. That's that's the difference of, like, you could be an artist and you could be successful and like live a life of i'm sure luxury or whatever but if you you know in years and years you want to be a part of history it's you know sometimes pleasing your immediate peers is most likely not yeah i think the the answer is like what type of an artist do you want to be do you want to be successful or do you want to change the world for the better right and i would absolutely put him in that second category because him being the predecessor to all these different movements yeah that's clear he's a badass i like him yeah, so that is our boy, Austin Osmond Spare. Thank you guys for sticking through for two episodes of this. Um, yeah, he deserves I was like, he deserves two. All right, what's your socials? Oh, what my Instagram we- is Monterey M M O N A R E Y M. And I think I'm the same on everything across the board. Okay. Yeah. Well, there we go. And you guys should look up Austin Spare and someone should buy me and send me the book of pleasure because I really want that first edition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thanks. Oh yeah.